tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about nightmarish maladies and creature encounters. I'm Otis Jiry, host of the Scary Stories Told in the Dark podcast, now in its seventh season. My show is available on iTunes and wherever podcasts can be found. And tonight, I'll once again be filling in as host on behalf of my very good friend, Steve Taylor, and I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring life to the frightening fiction of Christopher Burke and Ryan Harple are voice talents Mick Dark and Drew Blood. Now, get your tickets ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Christopher Burke and is performed by Mick Dark. Mick's series of the same name can be found on our YouTube channel, where you'll find two new weekly releases from him and a playlist with all his stellar stories compiled in one easy-to-find place. So if you enjoy his rendition of tonight's dark tale, please do him a favor and check him out. And let him know that Otis sent you. In our first round of Frightening Fiction tonight, we'll meet Ellen and Julia, whose father, when they were young, told them the story of a dreadful creature, but left out the most gruesome parts. But when they'd gotten to be a bit older, they asked him to tell him the whole tale. In doing so, however, they discovered the tale might not be as fictional as they once suspected. Without further ado, I present to you... The Drognar. When Ellen and Julia were four and six years old, Dad would leave out the most gruesome parts of the story of the Drognar. But when they had gotten to be seven and nine, though Julia was getting a bit old for bedtime stories and could read pretty well on her own, they asked him to tell her the whole story and leave nothing out. Dad would extinguish the cigarette before entering their rooms, push his glasses up on his nose, take a sip of the whiskey nightcap he had each night, and finally settle down on one of their beds. It was a ritual the three of them shared that they pretended amongst themselves was a secret from Mother. Once upon a time long ago, there lived a clever and terrifying beast called the Drognar, he'd begin. Over the years, he'd added more and more adjectives, such as terrifying and clever, in order to ensure the story's continued appeal to them. We have the story of Adam and Eve, of God creating the world and all of its animals and plants and oceans, but one thing that is largely missing is the story of the creation of the Drognar. For not only does no one know it's also the case that maybe, just maybe, the Drognar is the only thing on Earth that wasn't created by God. No one knows how long it has existed, for it is notorious 
for its ability to blend in unnoticed. Ellen pulled her blanket up to her chin and closed her eyes. Julia looked at Dad, pretending to an air of confidence that was due the older sibling. Legends have it that the Drognar used to eat one small child each year as a sacrifice to ensure the fertility of a town's harvest or the success of the next year's hunting season. The Drognar did not much care which of the town's children were offered, but invariably they chose the worst behaved, for children who break the rules too much could grow up to be quite bad for everyone indeed. This was how the Drognar survived. Once he consumed the naughty child, he or she would become a part of him, their soul trapped inside, sustaining him for another year. But the Drognar grew stronger over the years, as more and more souls of naughty children accumulated in him. Sometimes they would be children who had become notorious thieves even at a young age, or who went about picking fights amongst the others, or who were unaccountably cruel to animals and the like. Julia develops a faint smirk as she sees Ellen try to feign that she was asleep rather than frightened. Father reaches over to the dresser, takes a sip of his whiskey, and then resumes the story. Many warriors for a time had attempted to hunt and kill the Drognar, but they never returned. Legend holds that the Drognar has a lair somewhere in which their remains are gathered, for the Drognar is quite a pack rat indeed. So, over time, the villagers stopped sending warriors and chose simply to cut their losses and appease the Drognar with a single naughty child, and accept that this was simply the way things were. But one day, the daughter of a famous scholar, a renowned teller of tales and legend, took it into her head that she would defeat the Drognar by becoming that year's sacrifice. Since she'd heard the legends more times than anyone, she felt that she knew the secret to its defeat. This little girl's name was Ellen. Father said, looking over at Ellen on the bed. Her fake sleep eyes fluttered at the attention, and she failed to suppress a faint smile that came over her. Sometimes the brave child's name was Julia. The name did not matter. After all, surely it had varied a thousand times with each father's different telling of the legend. Ellen would become the most brave, most strong, most determined person in her soul, and her soul would survive beyond her body inside the Dragnar, and she would use the force of her will to slay it from the inside, no matter how long it took. This was very brave indeed, but she knew that if she revealed her plan, her parents would do everything they could to stop it. So, she set about to misbehaving terribly. Overnight, she underwent a complete change of character. Where she had been noble, she became petty. Where she'd been peaceful, she becomes combative. Where she'd been generous, she became cruel. This caused enormous distress to her parents, for obvious reasons. After much arguing and being punished, over the next several months, everyone in the village had grown tired of her behavior and her parents' worst fears came true. She was chosen as the child that must appease the Drognar. She was taken to the forested path at which each year's sacrifice was taken. There was much weeping, and her parents had to be restrained and led away by the villagers. Daddy? Julia interrupted. Yes, sweetheart. Why didn't they just all gang up on the Drognar? Well, you see, the, the Drognar would only appear if the child was the only one there. For deep down, it is cowardly. And if the villagers tried to trick it and ambush it when it came for the child, they would incur its wrath, and it would smoke at its nostrils, breathe its fiery breath, open its mouth wide and devour them all one by one, and more people would have died that way. And the Drognar had special eyes that could see far better than humans. 
Some legends say it has fake eyes to blend in with whatever environment it's in and in that it can remove the fake eyes so that it can see from inside its head with the power of all the souls that it had devoured. Now, Ellen was brave, but she was also terrified, as anyone would be. I know I would be, Father said. John? Mother called from down the hall. Are you getting the kids to bed or keeping them up all night? Just finishing up now, sweetheart, Father said and winked at his daughters, whom he loved very much. It took every ounce of courage that Ellen had to stand still and wait for the Drognar. But she had brought her special blanket with her, which had been blessed by the town's alchemist, so that whenever she got underneath it, nothing could see her. So if she lost her courage to carry through her plan, she could hide, and maybe the Drognar's eyes would not be able to see her. As the hour approached, and the sky faded to darkness, and the sounds of the day were replaced with the sounds of the night, she became more and more lonely and frightened. She second-guessed herself. She spread the blanket on the ground and curled up underneath it, pretending that she was already dead, and that the darkness of the blanket, within the darkness of the night, was just like it must be for her to be swallowed up by the Drognar and have her soul carried along inside him. Soon she heard a snorting, and a coughing, and a heavy breathing, and she knew it must be the Drognar, looking about for its yearly meal of naughty child. Where is my meal? It bellowed after searching fruitlessly, for Ellen was very, very frightened, and still hidden in the magic blanket. If I cannot find my meal, I shall pluck out my false eyes and hunt you with all my powers. I shall find you, for I can see everything. If you come out, I will make it easier for you. If you do not, I shall be very angry indeed. So... Ellen summoned her courage, deciding she must follow through with her plan, for she loved her parents and neighbors very much and wanted to save them at whatever cost. Here I am, Jognar. Ellen said as she revealed herself. I am to be your meal. Now be quick as you've promised. The Drognar snorted smoke through his nose, breathed his fiery breath, opened its mouth wider than wide, and gobbled her up quickly and painlessly. None of the villagers knew of the girl's brave plan, and they mourned her even though she'd been very naughty indeed. But Ellen's soul lived on inside the Drognar, and she was very strong. She worked hard to make the Drognar weaker and weaker. Eventually, the Drognar figured out what this brave girl's soul was doing, and he vomited her right back out, bellowed savagely, and left the village for good to go do his evil deeds elsewhere. Many years had passed, and Ellen had grown to adulthood. Her parents were quite old, but they were extremely grateful to hear what had happened. They cherished their daughter, and she cherished her parents for years to come. But nobody knows exactly what happened to the Drognar. It's extremely difficult to hunt because it can change forms at will. It is thought, though, that its natural form is something like what you think of as a dragon. And that it is the origin for all our stories about evil dragons. For, you see, stories of dragons exist in almost any culture from which we could guess that the Drogner had been on the move ever since, choosing to keep a lower profile, so nothing like the brave Ellen could ever happen again and defeat him. These are the sorts of things Daddy studies. And maybe someday one of you will grow up to do the same. Father kissed each of them and said goodnight. The faint fire of his nightcap 
causing them to wrinkle their noses as his glasses bumped into their foreheads. Good night, Daddy, said Julia. Good night, Daddy, said Ellen. Daddy? Ellen said, Yes, sweetheart? Father asked. Can the drognar see through the magic blanket if it plucks out its false eyes? And uses the power of all the souls inside it to see? Well, sweetie, we, we don't know, Father said. The legends are different. Sometimes yes and sometimes no. But in this version, it never gets the chance to take its false eyes out. Because the brave little child steps out and confronts the drognar. It was a story they'd heard many times over the years, as her father was quite fond of telling stories, and they were quite fond of hearing them. As they lived in the countryside with no nearby neighbors, they often amused themselves by playing together. Ellen and Julia would take turns being the drognar and the brave child, and they had a worn, beat-up blanket they kept separate from their bedding that they used for the magic blanket. The family lived in a house that was small, but they had a great deal of land surrounding it, which bordered on a forest that was pleasant to stroll through and play in. Father and mother frequently took walks down the path when they needed to clear their heads from the stresses of the day, or father needed to think about the research he was doing for his book on folklore for the university in town where he taught. I am the drugnar! Julia would bellow out in the field between their home and the forest. I'm here to eat your soul. Ellen would smile into the oblivion provided by the blanket and do her best to jump out and surprise the Julia Drognar. Sometimes, Ellen would shout, I'm the Drognar. I'm here to eat your soul. And Julia would hide in the welcoming darkness of the magic blanket until she could surprise the Ellen Drognar. This was the manner in which many of their days passed during the summer when they were not in school, for none of their friends from school lived near enough to see them very often. But one day, while father was teaching his classes, mother called each of them into the living room and sat them down. Listen, girls, I need to talk to you about something very, very important. I need for you to do as you're told. The girls nodded politely. Okay, mommy, Julia said. Do you know a little girl named Rosa Vaughn from school? Mommy asked. Yes, said Ellen. Yes, said Julia. They were in different grades at the small school nearby, but it was the sort of school where everybody knew everybody. I don't want to frighten you, but something very sad has happened recently. It seems Miss Rosa had gone missing, and her parents are very worried. A sudden pang of fright panged at Julia's heart. A sudden jolt of panic jolted at Ellen's heart. Now, have you girls talked to Rosa any time recently? Have you any idea if she might have run away or where she might have gone to? No, said Julia, looking very sad. No, said Ellen, looking equally sad. Okay, well, I thought not, but until Rosa comes back, we have to be very careful, because sometimes there are bad people who do bad things to girls and boys. I need you to be big girls and stay closer to the house. You can play your games here all you want, but I don't want you going into the forest by yourselves anymore. I need you to not go past the big tree out in the yard. Do you understand? Oh, but mommy, Julia said. No, buts girls. I need you to be brave and grown up for me right now. You're going to be okay if you obey me and your father. Was it the Drognar? Ellen said. Maybe the Drognar got her. Now, now, that's just one of your father's stories, Ellen. If you do as I say, no one, not even the Drognar, will get you. Do you understand? Yes, Mommy. Ellen said. When father returned home, he was astonished to hear about Rosa's disappearance but he reinforced to the girls that it was important for them to obey Mother and stay close by. What if it was the Drognar, Daddy? Ellen asked. 
I promise you, sweetie, it was not the Drognar, father said. Later that week, the girls asked if they could walk through the forest with their parents, since they were growing bored being so close to the house all the time. Mother and father agreed, and they packed a small picnic and set off down the trail through the woods. After they'd gone into the forest for a time, they came upon a clearing where they usually took a break when they were strolling through the area. They spread their little picnic on the ground, ate their lunch, and then Ellen and Julia asked if they could go off and play for a bit, as long as they didn't go too far. Yes, that's fine, kids. Just behave yourself and don't go too far. Ellen and Julia scuttled off into the woods a short ways. Soon they came by a strange little cave they'd never seen before, even though they thought they'd explored the area exhaustively. What if this is the Drognar's lair? Ellen asked. Don't be silly. That's just a kid's story, Julia said. But how do you know? Ellen asked. I just do. Now hush up. Julia said. They entered the first few feet of the cave where the light penetrated, too frightened to go any further, for although Julia felt that she was outgrowing the story, enough belief remained in her that she didn't want to chance upon inadvertently stumbling upon the Drognar and getting gobbled up. But just at the edge of the light, something caught their eyes. Whatever it was, it was brightly colored. What is that? Ellen asked. I'm not sure. Julia asked. Go, go on and get it, why don't you? I'm not going in there. Ellen whispered. I don't want to get gobbled up. Don't be silly, Julia said. Dragons aren't real. But as she said that, she thought she detected a faint odor of smoke. She couldn't be sure if it was real or just her imagination. Oh, fine. I'll get it, Ellen whispered. She creeped forward, slowly and quietly, doing her best to be brave for her sister. She picked it up and scurried back to the lighted portion of the cave entrance. That's Rosa's backpack, Julia whispered fiercely. They both became very, very frightened and screamed when a hand was laid on each of their shoulders. Girls, their father said. Girls, calm down. It, it's just me. He took his hand off their shoulders and reached up to the cigarette in his mouth, flicking some ashes aside. But what did we tell you about staying close by? This is too far away. You've been very naughty. That must have been the smoke I smelled, Julia thought with relief. <laughs> no dragons after all. I knew it. I just knew it. What is that you've got there, girls? Mother asked. Ellen held it up to her. Why, this is Rose's red backpack, Father said. We must go home now. This is serious. When they got home... Ellen and Julia went to their room, quite frightened by the turn of events. Ellen hid under the magical blanket, and Julia sat on her bed, thinking. Ellen pretended that whatever had gotten Rosa, the Drognar, or some other monster, or maybe just some bad person out there, could not see underneath it. I'm scared, Julia said. What if it's the Drognar's lair? asked Ellen. Whoa, what if it gets mom or dad when they're on one of their walks out that way? Asked Julia. Wouldn't we have seen it, or heard it, or smelled it, if that was his lair? Ellen asked. Well, we, we smelled smoke, but that was just dad. What if the Drognar smoke smells like cigarette smoke? You wouldn't be able to tell, Julia said. And since we couldn't see anything in there, maybe the Drognar sees around his lair with the power of the souls that are inside him. Those would make it so it could see in the dark. Ellen didn't say anything but grew more frightened. I don't 
convert the Drognar to gobble up Mommy and Daddy, Ellen said finally, her voice muffled by the blanket. I know. We'll sneak into Daddy's study and read more about the Drognar. There has to be a way to tell if it's out there. We have to protect them. They walk out that way all the time, and it could get them. While mother and father were in the kitchen at the phone, talking about the backpack and making phone calls to the proper authorities, Julia and Ellen snuck into the study and looked for one of his books that might have more information on the Drognar in it. Giants, magic, and dragons, and something of myth. Julia read off the spine of one. Imaginary fire, being an invest... In Investic a tea on of the his history of dragons and why are grown-ups books names so long? Julia said angrily. She read off a few more titles and flipped through the table of contents as she'd learned how to do in school last year. Here, she told Ellen. This chapter says it's about the Drognar. She flipped it open to the specified page and began to read. Many of the words were too big. But when she found the passage she could read, she did so. The legends vary. But one consistent thread is the sacrificial daughter. In every story... It is a young girl that must be brave to save her family or neighbors. The Drognar is often a shapeshifter of some kind, but its true form is usually pretty similar to what we now call dragons. It seems likely that Drognar is one source for the word and that it has simply changed over time. It should be noted that this creature often has the outer look of whatever form it has adopted, but it remains able to perform many of its reptilian functions, such as opening its mouth almost 180 degrees on a hinged jaw. It often has some form of smoke that comes out of it and fire on its breath and the ability to remove its eyes so that it can see with the power of the souls it has eaten. Julia struggled with some of the words, but the gist of it was clear to them, as this seemed to confirm the story as they'd heard it from their father. But how did mom and dad know where we were. What if... What if... Dad is the Drognar? It can shift shapes. Ellen said. Don't be silly. Julia said. She continued to read aloud. Some forms of the legend have the brave child being swallowed up and then defeating the Drognar from inside until it leaves the village alone. In most cases, it usually moves on, sets up somewhere new, and adopts a new outer form. In some versions of the story, it can be killed by tricking it into drinking poison or into falling into some elaborate trap. But these seem to be later additions to the tale, and for most of its history, it cannot be killed, only forced to move elsewhere. These tricks are in invariably plotted by the figure of the brave child after her family or neighbors are believed to be under threat from the Drognar. It is often made clear in the legend that the Drognar is neither male or female, 
though it can adopt the outer appearance of either. Some versions hold that the Drognar is solitary, and in some cases it lives with one or more others of its kind. Dad cigarettes, Julius said suddenly, after pausing at the end of the passage. It just says the Drognar breathes smoke. It doesn't say how. Maybe the Drognar has turned into Daddy. Ellen starts to weep in panic. Don't say that. Daddy's not the Drognar. It's just cigarettes. Ellen said. Keep your voice down. Julia whispered fiercely. We aren't supposed to be in here. Girls? Their mother called from down the hall. What are you up to? They quickly cleaned up and put things back where they'd found them, then scurried back to their room. Ellen pulled the blanket over her head and said a muffled, I'm scared. It'll be okay, Julia said. That's not the Drognar. If it's just a story, and even if he was... In the stories, the brave child wins in the end and gets back with her family. But what if that part isn't true? Ellen whispered, for they could hear their parents coming down the hall, the sound of their deliberate footsteps bouncing down the hall towards their room. The whiskey, Julia said. The whiskey, fire. What's that then? Father asked poking his head into the room. Are you girls all right? Mother asked. Yes, Mommy. Just scared. Julia replied. Ellen made a noise that sounded like an affirmative from beneath her magical blanket. Mm-hmm. Julia, can you find your sister, please, and both of you come down to the kitchen? Some nice men are coming out to talk to us about Rosa and her red backpack, and it's important that we have our stories straight. Mother and father walked back down the hall to the kitchen. Julia walked over to where Ellen was hiding under the magical blanket. What did they mean, find you? Couldn't they see you were under the blanket? Ellen started to cry. Had she been invisible to their father? But how could that be? The whiskey. Julia whispered. Smells like fire. Ellen wept and trembled and tried her hardest to be brave for the sake of herself and her sister and mother. She had doubted at first, but now was beginning to wonder if her father really could be the dreaded Drognar in human form. And his glasses, Julia said. What if those are his fake eyes? What if Daddy really did gobble up poor Rosa? and her soul is inside of him. He wouldn't, Ellen sobbed, even though she was starting to think that just maybe he would. We've got to get to the kitchen, or they'll start to suspect we're on to them, Julia said. We have to be brave. He's not going to harm us while Mother is here. The Drogner can only gobble people up if they're alone, remember? Ellen summoned all of her courage, quieted her sobs, and cast off the magical blanket. Holding hands, the sisters marched quietly down the hall to the kitchen, where the parents were sitting with somber looks. Girls, the police shall be here in a few moments, okay? Now we're going to tell them what we saw, their father said. Just be honest, and it'll be over soon. They're going to help find Rosa, okay? Ellen and Julia looked at each other, scared but hopeful. Soon the police arrived, and they were all quite nervous. But they told the police what had happened as best they could. They told the police about taking a walk in the woods, and about wanting to play their pretend game about the dreaded Drognar, and about stopping for a rest, and about stumbling upon the strange little cave, and about seeing the little red backpack, and about their father exclaiming, why, this is Rosa's red backpack. At that, one of the nice police officers asked, And how could you ascertain that the backpack belonged to Miss Vaughn? 
His voice had the flat tone of a person going through a routine procedure, repeated day in and day out, with persons who often forgot things and had to repeat their story several times before all of the details were clear. Julia and Ellen both gulped. How had Daddy known that it was Rose's backpack? I noticed the school papers inside, Father said. They had her name on them. The children wanted to feel reassured, but they couldn't remember him ever looking inside of the backpack. After an hour or so, the police appeared satisfied. They collected Rose's red backpack and thanked the family for their information, then left. Later that night, the girls could not get to sleep, for they were even more frightened now that night had fallen. We have to find out for certain. I don't want to get gobbled up, Ellen whispered. Me neither. We have to figure out some other way to defeat him, if he's the Drognar, whispered Julia. For, as brave as she was, she wasn't brave enough to risk getting gobbled up and having her soul trapped inside somewhere. The two sisters stole down to their father's study while their parents were asleep, looking for more information that might be useful. Julia pulled out the volume they'd been reading from and began again. According to most legends, the only way to tell for sure if someone or something was in fact the Drognar in disguise would be to ask it to say its true name, for the Drognar is unable to say its true name aloud, for it is a creature devoted to deception. If after three attempts to get it to say its true name aloud, it refuses or is unable to do so, or it otherwise tries to trick the asker, most versions of the legend hold that the creature can be confirmed with certainty as being the Drognar or one of the Drognars if there exists more than one. Although the Drognar cannot die of natural causes or old age, one such legend differs from the story in which the brave child gets gobbled up and defeats it from within. In this version, reports indicate that the brave child tricked it into drinking poison, where swords and traps and arrows failed, poison seems to have worked for this village. That's it, Julia said. We'll test him. Ask him to tell us the story of the Drognars so we can get to sleep. When he does, we'll ask him his name three times. If he can't say his true name, then we'll know it's him, and then we'll tell Mom and Dad we'll have to get away. So Ellen and Julia went down to the hall to their parents' bedroom and woke them, explaining they were too frightened to sleep. And could Dad tell them a story? They did not say which story, as he had always asked them to keep their bedtime story ritual a secret from Mom. He grumbled for a moment, but kind-heartedly got out of bed, urging Mother to stay while he read the children to sleep. He stopped in his study, poured himself a small glass of whiskey, pushed his glasses up on his nose, lit a cigarette, and then set it in an ashtray. Father followed the girls down to their bedroom, and they got under their blankets, hearts pounding furiously. Before he started, Julia asked, Daddy, what is your true name? Ellen looked on nervously. What? Father asked with a look of confusion. You... Your, your true name, Julia said. I was just wondering. I've no idea what you're talking about, darling, Father said. You know my name, silly. But we've never heard you say your true name, said Ellen. Can't you just tell us? Look, I don't know what game this is, but if we're going to have a story to get you to sleep, I'd like to get on with it. Father said, I'm very tired, as I'm sure you understand. With that third request avoided, 
Ellen and Julia exchanged a meaningful look. They knew. The fear was almost too much for them, even after they tried to be even braver than they'd been earlier in the day. The next morning, while their father was at work, they agreed that they simply must tell their mother, who was the only grown-up around that they could trust. You think your father is a what? She asked. The Drogner. Julia explained for what felt like the hundredth time. Listen, girls, I know you're deeply upset over your friend, but that's no excuse to go about accusing your own father of having been involved or something ridiculous like being a monster you've heard about. I really don't know why he tells you so many stories, but that's all they are, stories. There's been a real crime here, and it's incredibly irresponsible to go about making these kind of bizarre accusations. Mother said. But Mom! Ellen said. Mom, you've got to believe us. We read about him in the books in his study. It's him! That's enough! Mother said. You're being extremely naughty all of a sudden. You've been so well behaved. I don't know what has caused this change in behavior overnight, but you must drop this right now. Do you understand? But Mom! We don't want to get gobbled up. What if you get gobbled up? You've got to do something. Both girls were now crying and frantic. That's enough, I said. Mother said. Now, you go to your room until supper and you calm down. Your father will be here any minute. And I don't want him to have to listen to this nonsense. The girls went to their room, sobbing and terrified. Would no one listen to them? Would no one protect them, or would they have to be brave enough to defeat the Drognar on their own before it gobbled up another child? They talked quietly in their room while their mother prepared dinner. We've got to do what it says in the story, Ellen said. How? Oh, is there any poison in the house? Julia said. There's got to be something, Ellen said. While Mother was finishing supper, the girls crept down to the bathroom. The medicine cabinet was just out of reach, and they'd been told they must never open it. Well, we've been quite naughty anyhow, and that's part of the story, Julia said. She boosted Ellen up onto the sink, and Ellen opened the cabinet. She couldn't read the labels on the bottles, so she grabbed all of them that she could carry and dropped down onto the ground. Quick, down to the study, Ellen whispered. Julian nodded, and they crept down to their father's study. They looked about frantically and found his favorite whiskey in the drawer to his desk. Can you open it? Ellen asked. Julius scrambled, half panicked, but trying to be brave as they did what must be done. They wrestled with the bottle for a moment until she got it open. Ew! said Ellen, as she smelled the fiery drink. Ew! said Julia, as she too smelled the fiery drink. It was much stronger in the bottle than it was in their father's fiery breath. The girls took turns opening all ten of the bottles they'd scavenged from the medicine cabinet. They opened every capsule from every bottle and dumped the powdery or liquidy contents into the whiskey hoping the dark color of the stinky drink would cover up whatever they were adding to it. Pill after pill after pill. Medicine bottle after medicine bottle. The girls emptied them all as quickly as possible. They reclosed the bottle of father's whiskey and put it back in the drawer just as they heard him pull into the drive. Quick, Julia said, as she and Ellen frantically scooped up the empty pill bottles and hurried down to the room. Where will we hide these? Julia whispered. As the front door opened and the Drognar's footsteps echoed through the house. Girls, supper time. Mother yelled from down the hall. I know, under the magical blanket. Ellen whispered. You won't see them. Julia, Ellen? The horrible Drognar masquerading as father, called. Come on now, time to eat! 
They stashed bottle after bottle after bottle under the magical blanket and dashed down the hall. Doing their best to compose themselves and calmly face the drognar during dinner. They did their best to wolf down their chicken and potatoes and corn and to drink down their milk and to finish their dessert. They tried to be as brave as the brave child in the stories and talk to the drognar without becoming too frightened. And the drognar told them all about his day at work. After dinner, they went back to their room and pretended to play, but they mostly just talked nervously and tried to figure out what might happen after the drognar was dead. They tried to figure out what would happen if the poison didn't kill the drognar. They tried to figure out how to comfort their mother when the drognar died and revealed its true dragony form. Hopefully, then their mother would finally believe them. Daddy? Julia called after a while. Daddy? Ellen echoed after Julia. Are you ready for bed and a story? Their father said, poking his head into their room. He carried his customary nightcap of that awfully fiery stuff and smoked his customary cigarette and pushed his glasses back on his customary nose. He took a sip of his customary nightcap and placed his customary cigarette in the customary ashtray he carried and sat down. Before we do story time, uh, I'm afraid I've got to talk to you girls. Father began. This isn't going to be easy, he added and finished off the last of his customary nightcap. Julie and Ellen exchanged a glance. He'd drunk it and hadn't noticed. They'd tricked the drognar. Their hearts beat faster. How long would it take for the poison to destroy the drognar? How long before they no longer had to be afraid of being gobbled up? Your mother... Your mother tells me you've been talking to her about this drognar business. He whispered and then sighed with a look of sorrow on his face. Don't you remember? I asked you never to tell her about that. Julia gulped and nodded, trying to be as brave as the brave child. Ellen gulped and nodded, trying to be as brave as the brave child also. That was a very... Very naughty thing to do, the drognar said. I just, I just don't know what has come over you girls all of a sudden. You're normally so well behaved. Don't you imagine I have my reasons for not wanting you to tell your mother about the tale of the drognar? Julian Ellen just looked at one another, confused. Don't you know by now that I've been trying to teach you in secret about how to defeat the Drognar? It was very, very bad when you told your mother that I'd been teaching you all these years. I wanted to protect you from getting gobbled up. Tears started to run silently down Ellen's cheeks. Julia began to sweat in fear, trying to fight it off like... The brave child would. Just then, the drognar began to cough. For you, <laughs> for y you see, <laughs> the drognar began, but his face started to rapidly change color, and he could not get the rest of the sentence out. His coughs and gasps grew louder. <laughs> the poison, it was working. They had tricked the drognar. He hacked and coughed and gasped and tried to cry for help. 
but to no avail. The Drognar's skin started to change color, and he fell to the floor and grew still. The Drognar's face was purple, and it appeared to be dead. Ellen said, But what if it's a trick? Julia said, Only one way to find out. They ran to fetch their mother in a panic. What is it, girls? Mother demanded. They were babbling excitedly, and she couldn't decipher their sentences. Where's your father? Would you stop with this drog nar nonsense? I can't understand you at all. Just come, mother, please, Julia pleaded. They dashed down the hall to their bedroom, leading their mother. When they got there, the Drognar had not reverted to its dragony shape. Mother let out an inhuman wail when she saw the body. <coughs> what have you done? She demanded, hands on her hips. We've, we've killed the awful Drognar. Can't you see? Ellen said. We didn't want to get gobbled up. Julia explained. The Drognar's face was still purple and swollen, and a bit of froth had trickled out of its mouth. Its brown, human eyes stared vacantly at the ceiling. The girls each tried to be as brave as the brave child, while Mother stared first at the body, then at them, as though trying to construct a narrative of the events that had taken place out of her sight. You've been very naughty, girls, Mother said. Very, very naughty. Perhaps the naughtiest girls in our whole village. Ellen and Julia looked at one another, scared and sad. I thought Rosa had been the naughtiest, Mother said. Apparently, I was mistaken. For murdering your own father is just about the naughtiest thing I can think of. I don't... Uh... Julia started. Smoke began curling out of Mother's nostrils. Mommy? Ellen said in a frightened voice. Mother let out another inhuman wail, opening her mouth wider than they'd ever seen her open it before. She grabbed Julia, who began screaming, and the room became hotter and hotter. Somehow, her mouth continued to get wider, and she pitched the struggling Julia into her gaping mouth and gobbled her up. Ellen ran into the closet and got beneath the magic blanket. Sloppy wet sounds came from the bedroom as Mother chewed on Julia. Such awful gnashing, crunching sounds. She began to cry harder than she'd ever cried before. Another roar, and the heat from a belch of flames that must have come from Mother's, the real Drognar's, gaping maw. Ellen tried to be as brave as the brave child. Ellen hoped that the magic blanket would work. Foolish child, don't you know I can take my false eyes out? and see you no matter where you are. I don't know what hogwash your father has been telling you, but rest assured, I'm going to gobble you all up. That blanket, it won't protect you, for I can see everything with the power of all the souls I've gobbled up before. Ellen hoped desperately that at least some of her father's version of the story was true, most especially the part about the blanket. Because, as she peeked out from under it, she heard a pair of ripping sounds, as of flesh being torn, and then two popping sounds, as of two eyeballs being popped out of a drognar's head. 
And she saw through a gap between the blanket and floor the two fake human eyeballs land on the other side of the room. She felt very, very unbrave after all, because the stories she had been told had been very, very misleading. And the Drognar still seemed very, very hungry. Today's episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's the new year, and with that comes expectations of better things to come and optimism for most people. However, some of us just aren't wired that way. Be it the stress of life, anxiety about how things are going for you personally, or the helplessness felt about the future, it takes a toll on all of us to some degree. For me, there's always stress and anxiety about getting enough work to get by financially. I try not to let it get to me, but there are times when I'm not so successful. And during those times, you just need someone you can talk to to put things into perspective for you. That's where BetterHelp can allow you to sort things out. BetterHelp isn't just self-help. They have professional counselors who assess your needs, then match you with your own licensed professional therapist, connecting you safely and privately online. You can begin in under 24 hours, and you can message them at any time. BetterHelp has one commitment, to facilitate great therapeutic matches that will help you when you need it. You can do it from home via scheduled weekly video or phone sessions, and you can access them from anywhere in the world. Another plus is the vast range of expertise offered that may not be available locally to you. Best of all, they're more affordable than traditional counseling, and financial aid is available. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash chilling. Join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Tell them that Otis sent you and thank you for your support of our sponsor and this program. I hope you enjoyed The Drognar, as written by Christopher Burke and performed by Mick Dark. As a reminder, you can hear more of Mick on our official YouTube channel. Just search for him by name, Mick Dark, or watch for his latest releases with two new tales to terrify each and every week. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by the very talented and critically acclaimed Ryan Harville and performed by Drew Blood. If you enjoy Drew's performance, please check out more of his work on our channel as well, also under a series of the same name. Drew is releasing brand new content every week as well, so you've got plenty of catching up to do, and plenty more to come. In Drew and Ryan's latest contribution, we'll meet a gentleman who gives a whole new meaning to the old adage that sometimes our worst enemy is ourselves. Now, without further ado, I present to you a half hour of hell. Cal's phone slipped from his hand, landing in his lap, startling him awake. <gasps> he looked around the room, orienting himself. He was still in the recliner. It's familiar comfort grounding him and bringing him back to the present. He dozed off while staring at his phone, which had become his habit lately. Turn on the TV, watch until bored, stare at the phone until passing out. Cal pressed his legs down on the footrest until the recliner retracted, then stood and stretched, listening to the small pops from his spine. From his spot on the couch, George raised his head. The golden retriever watched him as he stood, 
one eyebrow up as if he had just been asked a question. Always vigilant, Cal said to the dog. Aren't you supposed to be watching the place while I sleep? George's only response was to lower the one brow and raise the other. Cal patted his thigh. Come on, he said. I guess we both need to eat something. He led George into the kitchen. The dog sat patiently as Cal brought out the dry food and filled his bowl. George immediately went to work on it. I'm glad one of us has an appetite, Cal said. He was rarely hungry and mostly fed himself out of self-preservation. He knew he needed food, but didn't care much if he ate at all. One of the many gifts that depression had generously bestowed upon him. Cal sighed and went into the refrigerator, then peered inside at the meager groceries of a man not too far removed from his divorce. I'm thinking scrambled eggs, he said, looking back at George. The dog ignored him, preferring to continue crunching away. Yeah, you're right. Probably should have some toast, too. Scrambled eggs and toast. Cheap, quick, and barely any cleanup afterwards. Plus, cooking and cleaning made him feel like he'd accomplished something during the day. Sometimes it was the small victories that made all the difference. Or at least, that's what his therapist had said. He gently placed the egg container down on the countertop, then opened the bread. He put two slices into the toaster and pushed the handle down. The slots began to glow with a faint orange light as the heat and filaments warmed up. Cal reached into the cabinet and grabbed the bowl. George sat and stared at him. The dog's eyes dark and focused. His food was already gone. You're never satisfied, Cal said. Well, you're just going to have to see if there's any leftovers because I'm not cooking just for you. Cal cracked an egg on the rim of the bowl in one practice motion, letting the golden yolk free without spilling a drop on the countertop. Okay, I might make an extra for you, he said, discarding the empty shell and grabbing another egg. You've been pretty good today, even though you did fall asleep on the job. There was a metallic pop from the toaster, and George jumped back. The sound, coupled with George's reaction, made Cal jump as well. He felt his breath catch painfully in his lungs, and the egg he was holding slipped from his fingers. Everything slowed. Cal's perception tightened into a single point of focus. The egg was falling through the air, and he could see that its texture was much rougher than his sense of touch had led him to believe. Its ovoid shape spun end over end, its descent to the floor as inevitable as death. Its whirling shadow grew larger and larger on the tiled floor. The egg hit the floor, and he watched as cracks grew from the point of impact, as the yolk was driven between the shards, as something useful became nothing more than a mess. Cal's pulse hammered in the sides of his neck. You were okay, he told himself. Small beads of sweat began to form on his forehead. <laughs> Everything is fine. Just... just relax. The fingers of his left hand began to tingle. Clean this up, and then just go sit down. His knees became weak, the muscles around each joint failing to keep him upright. God, God damn it, he said and sat down hard. George was there in an instant, his paws in Cal's lap and his head beneath Cal's chin. Cal raised the weak hand up to the dog's head and stroked the soft fur behind his ears. He let his weight rest on George, who supported him, keeping him from slumping over. Hey, George, he whispered. Hey, buddy, I'm okay. I just, I just need to make it to my chair. My medicine is right there on the table. Get the meds, calm down, and go to sleep. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Cal placed his hands on the floor and began to crawl, not trusting himself to stand. George kept his pace, never moving more than a few inches from his side. After an eternity of pulling himself across the carpet, he reached his chair. 
It was a brown suede mountain, its summit so far away that Cal wanted to weep. He readied himself, reaching an arm up that insurmountable cliffside and gripping it tightly. <sighs> Gotta get up, he said. But what if that's it? A voice answered. The last bit of exertion that pushes you over the edge. Cal shook his head. I'm fine. There's nothing physically wrong with me. Are you willing to bet your life on it? He took a shallow breath and lifted himself from the floor, then half sat, half fell into the recliner. George whined. I'm fine, buddy, he said. We made it. Just gotta relax. Cal forced himself to take a deep breath through his nose, expanding his diaphragm instead of his chest. Belly breath, his therapist called them. He held it, counted, then slowly released it from his mouth. Without warning, his heart rate increased, pounding in his chest as if he had just ran to the chair instead of crawl. Cal's breathing quickened. His chest rose and fell rapidly with each sharp breath. See? This is it. It's over. Your heart is going to rupture. I always knew there was something wrong with it. Some defect that none of the doctors could ever find. I... I don't want... to die, he managed. Well, then we'll need to call an ambulance. No. We're not doing that again. Then you're going to die. Cal wanted to argue, wanted to shake his head, but moving was hard. His arms were leaden. He looked down at his chest and watched the force of his heartbeat shake the muscles there. This, this will be over soon, he said. Thirty minutes, maybe an hour. Or, the voice whispered, this could be one of the bad ones. You may be glued to that chair for hours. George whined and placed his head on top of Cal's hand. Cal tried to reach up to pet him, but only managed to make his fingers twitch. What's poor George going to do when you're gone, huh? Who will take care of him? You have no friends to check on him. You saw to that. Pushed him away one at a time. Not... My fault, Cal breathed. I never meant for that to happen. Yes, you did, the voice said. They only wanted to help, and you selfishly... They were better off without me, Cal said. Well, you're probably right about that, the voice tittered. Cal looked to the ceiling and stared at the yellowing paint. Please, God... Stop this! <laughs> the voice fired back, enraged. There is no God! You know that! But you'll sit there and cry to him like it's going to help. God died on the dirt road like the rest of them! The ceiling changed, glowing faintly like a projection screen. Cal closed his eyes tightly. No, not tonight. Please, he said. He opened his eyes and the ceiling was back to normal. Cal breathed a heavy sigh of relief. George nudged his hand and Cal found the strength to pedal. It was a slow process, but better than nothing. He moved the stroke underneath the dog's chin and felt his phone there between George's head and the chair. Good. Now we can call an ambulance, the voice said. Cal wrapped his fingers around the phone and shook his head. I'm going to be fine. I don't need an ambulance. His heart leapt painfully in his chest. Call them, the voice pleaded, before your heart locks up like a clenched fist. It's not my heart, Cal said with a wince. It's the muscles in my chest tightening. My heart is fine. I had it tested last time. A blood clot then. Formed in your legs after hours of sitting in this chair. 
feeling sorry for yourself. It's finally made its way all the way up to your heart. You should be thankful, really. If it had hit your brain, you may have survived. An invalid, bigger burden than you already are. Cal knew it was possible. He had been sedentary for too long. Hadn't he felt the pain in his calf yesterday? Or was he imagining it? No, it was pain. A warm throb and pain of warning. But there was no pain. He was sure of it. Wasn't he? There is no clot, he said. But there is. It's traveling, searching for a place to lodge itself and end you. <laughs> he looked at his phone. Every part of him wanted to unlock it and press those three little numbers that would make everything okay. Within minutes, he'd hear the sirens approaching and the medics would save him. Call them before it's too late. No, Cal said. Not again. I'm never going to go through that again. The doctors looked at me like I was crazy and the medics thought I was on drugs. And after all that, I still owe $900 for the ambulance ride. Well, it's your funeral. The left side of his chest seized, tightening, and sending off little currents of sharp pains that traveled to his shoulder. No, 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 He said breathlessly. He swapped his thumb over the phone screen, unlocking it and bringing up the contact list. Cal dialed the number and pressed the speakerphone icon. Finally listening to reason, eh? Good. Wait. You're not cop. God, you're pathetic. The phone rang once. Twice. She's not going to answer. You know that. But on the third ring, she did. Hello? Hey. Jen? Cal said. Cal? Hey, it's good to hear from you, but now isn't a good time. Cal took a deep breath. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just, uh... You're having a panic attack. She said. I can hear it in your voice. Jesus, Cal. Yes, he said, trying not to cry from the relief of hearing her voice. I can't catch my breath. And I can barely move. Is George with you? He's right here. Okay, good. She said. Keep him close. Try to relax. And I'm sure it's all going to be over soon. I'm trying, Jen. I've got chest pains and maybe a blood clot or something. I stopped myself from calling 911, but I don't know if maybe I should have just gone ahead and done it. His words came faster and faster, outrunning his breath. Maybe this is it, you know? I know that it could just be my usual symptoms, but what if it's not this time? And I don't do anything about it and... Stop it! Jen hissed. Just stop it, Cal. There is nothing physically wrong with you. There never is. All of the doctor visits and tests and emergencies and nothing was wrong i i know cal stuttered i just needed that's just it cal you always needed something that's why i left because i can't be what you need nothing i said ever helped nothing i did worked i'm sorry cal truly but it's been two years since the divorce and I can't be your crutch. Not anymore. And definitely not today. Cal could feel the pulse in his ears, like the tide slamming into the shore. Why not today? Jen sighed. I'm at my engagement party. Chris asked me to marry him, and I said yes. I had to step out just to take this call. Cal let out a shaky breath. I... I didn't know. I'm sorry. The voice said. Why are you sorry? 
She fucked him in your house, in your bed. You saw the emails, the messages, the pictures. Have some self-respect. No, I'm sorry, she said. I should have told you sooner. I just didn't want to hurt you. More, Cal said, surprised by the cold knife edge in his tone. What? You didn't want to hurt me more. Jen was silent. How long will it be, Jen? Cal said, his heart absolutely thudding against his breastbone. How long before you grow bored of him? Or you decide he's inconvenient and you find someone else to fuck? I am not doing this right now, she said, her voice cracking into a sob. Thanks for winning this day. <laughs> the line went dead and she was gone. Cal bit back a scream. George rushed in front of him, placing his paws on Cal's knees. His bark sounded like a question. It's fine, buddy, Cal said. I'm okay. But he wasn't. That soft glow came again, not just from the ceiling this time, but from everywhere. The world became ethereal. He was back in the Hindu Kush mountains, headed toward Kabul, and hopefully a nap. He sat in the rear of the Humvee, holding his M4 to his chest. They were last in the convoy, a bookend to the lead vehicle, three up-armored SUVs between them. The SUVs were driven by soldiers, but filled with civilians, contractors of all types. A few IT guys, a helo pilot, and at least one interpreter, all being transported to their new job sites. Ahead, the convoy leader came to an abrupt stop as a man led a line of goats across the road, his Kandahari cap bright white in the winter morning sunlight. Children walked along the side of the road, some pulling along small carts with their younger siblings in tow. Cal remembers this moment. The snow from the night before, hiding from the morning light in whatever shadows it could find. It's gleaming white, a stark contrast to the red-brown mud. There was a thump, small for an instant, like hitting a speed bump. Then they were slammed by the hand of God as the explosion rocked the convoy. The Humvee flipped and Cal's world spun with it. Then it was still and he hung upside down in his seat, the belt saving him from being tumbled like laundry in a dryer. Corporal Laramie's voice cut through Cal's dizziness. Laramie screamed. Egress! Egress! Cal pulled his seatbelt cutter from the front of his IOTV and hooked it over the belt, then severed it with a quick tug. He fell to the roof but managed to brace himself with his elbow. In the front seat, Staff Sergeant Green's body hung from his seatbelt, unmoving. A shard of metal nearly taking his head off. What was left of his neck released a thick stream of blood in time with his slowing heartbeat and there was nothing Cal could do. There was screaming as he crawled from the Humvee. From the shadows of alleys came armed men, all crying glory to God. Cal pulled himself up to a kneeling position and leveled his M4, flipping the selector switch to fire. The men began firing first. Small spurts of dust rose from the ground where bullets struck, and all around him was the ping and high whine of lead on steel bullets against vehicles. Cal opened fire. His first two shots went wide, but the third was true. And the fourth. The man closest to him spun and fell in the dirt. He did not rise. That left four, but Cal didn't even have time to take aim before the staccato rhythm of a machine gun filled the morning. He quickly glanced to his left, and there was PFC Dawson sitting in the gunner's seat of the lead Humvee. He strafed the gun left to right, creating a cloud of sand and a hell of rocks. Another snapshot in Cal's mind. The four men silhouetted in the dust with the sun at their backs as bullets chewed them. They never even cried out, just shook as if dancing. 
each jerk of their bodies punctuated by bursts of pink mist as the sunlight filtered through their blood. And then it was so quiet. Cal, Laramie, and Dawson stumbled from vehicle to vehicle looking for survivors but found none. The IED had detonated directly in the middle of the convoy, and the few people who had managed to crawl away from the wreckage had Matherian in a hell of bullets. Enough, Cal said, and for a moment the mountain town faded. I don't want to see any more, the voice said. His voice said, But we haven't gotten to the best part. No. Please, no. Cal pleaded, but he was turning his head because this had already happened. The tracks had been laid years ago, and he had no choice but to ride along. He looked to the edge of the road, to the children, to what was left of them lying in the shadows and snow. I don't want to see this in my head anymore, Cal sobbed. <laughs> In the red snow. Please stop! In the black shadows. Stop! <laughs> he slumped back into his recliner, covered in sweat and hyperventilating. If you want it out of your head, the voice said, you know how to do it. Simply make a hole and let it fall out. Cal stood, his legs shaky. <laughs> the TV powered on, and he was facing an image of himself on the screen. It's too much, isn't it? The other him said. How much more do you have to take? You've suffered enough. We have suffered enough. Cal nodded his head fresh tears fall into the carpet. Then end it, the other said. <laughs> no more heart hammer and panic. No more intrusive thoughts of Jen and Chris in your bed. No more dead children, Cal. You won't ever have to see them again. Just take the few steps to the bedroom. Get your pistol from the safe. And then... Rest. Cal stepped toward the bedroom. Yes, Cal. The other cooed. It's time to rest. Something brushed past his hand and he stopped. There was George, dropping the orange bottle of Cal's pills to the carpet. He nuzzled against Cal's hand and whined. Leave him, Cal, the other him said. He's better off without you. He can have a home with someone better. Someone whole. Cal looked into George's brown eyes and smiled. No, Cal said. As shitty as it is, he wants to stay here. With me. He stroked the fur beneath George's chin, then knelt and grabbed the bottle. No, the other cried. Don't you dare! He opened the bottle and shook out two pills. The other's voice rose into a cry. You want to keep doing this? Why? You fucking coward! You useless cuckold! Oblivion is better than being broken and you know it! Don't! Cal tossed the pills into his mouth and chewed, staring his other self down as he swallowed the bitter medicine. The TV snapped off. This isn't over, the voice said from far away. One day, one day it'll be the barrel in your mouth instead of the pills. Cal's thoughts began to soften, and he laid down on the carpet. Maybe, he whispered as the med started to work, and he began to drift. <sighs> but not today, asshole. Finally, he slept, his arm around George, the dog's body warm against his side.
Cal woke to sunlight piercing through the cracks between the blinds. George lifted his head and stared at him. Hey, boy, Cal said. You ready to go outside? George wagged his tail and bolted towards the back door. Cal followed. Maybe when you come back in, we can have those eggs, huh? He said, opening the door. George shot out like a bolt of golden light, making wide circles in the dewy grass. Cal walked back to the kitchen. The broken egg was still there from last night. He grabbed a handful of paper towels and began to pick up the pieces. I hope you enjoyed A Half Hour of Hell, as written by Ryan Harville and voiced by Drew Blood. If you enjoyed that last tale, I encourage all of you to visit Mr. Harville's official website, ryanharvillewriting.com. Harville spelled H-A-R-V-I-L-L-E. Again, that's ryanharvillewriting.com. You can also find his works on Amazon.com or connect with him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, you can hear more of our friend Drew Blood via his series of the same name on our official YouTube channel, where you'll hear haunting new tales each and every week. If you check him out, be sure to give him a thumbs up and leave a kind word. and Tell him you heard him here on this program and that Otis sent you. It wouldn't mean a lot to me. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And, of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling 
tales for dark nights. <laughs>